maybe, maybe open, open flame, flame is not what we want to do here. here. But hey, this was on the South Bank of London. <laughs> there were no rules. Hi everyone. I'm thrilled today to get to part two of our talk about Hamlet. Specifically today, we're going to be talking about the ghost of Hamlet's father and how that kind of relates in a very odd and roundabout way to the advent of the modern director. And then we're going to get into Elizabethan special effects. How do we get those pyrotechnics in the Renaissance? So let's get started. <laughs> Before we get to the rocky shores of Denmark and the intimidating towers of Elsinore Castle, I want to take a little quick detour south to 19th century Germany. Where else? Yes, 19th century Germany. The Congress of Vienna. The Frankfurt Assembly. The proclamation of the German Empire. And the birth of a little known figure in the timeline of modern theater, Franz von Dingelstedt. In the shadow of Napoleon's defeat, Franz von Dingelstedt was born in Hesse Castle. Franz was a German poet, playwright, and most notable for our purposes today, he was a theatrical producer and the appointed manager of theaters in Munich, uh, among other places. Dingelstedt was also the founder of the German Shakespeare Society, and he translated many of the Bard's works into German. He took those plays, put them together, produced them, took them out onto the road, toured around Germany. Now at the same time, an English actor manager by the name of Charles Keane was also taking his company into Berlin. Now before the advent of the modern director, you had what was known as the actor manager. Now who was the actor manager? These were people that uh, were not only actors, but took a leadership role, meaning that they picked the plays, they you know, usually pick plays that they could be the star in. So they were a leading player. They helped craft some of the lesser uh, actors' performances, and they also helped with some of the design elements. So they were really doing a big job of, of coordinating the whole thing. One of the most notable things about an actor manager is that they dealt with bookings, financial things. Um, basically, all the money business was uh, the responsibility of the actor manager. Now, at some point, while Charles Keane was going through the highways and byways of Berlin and Dingelstedt was touring his plays around, a young aristocrat, George II, Duke of Saxe-Meiningen, George II, George II, Duke of Saxe-Meiningen, he's very, he's pretty hot, to go see some of these plays. From these experiences, seeing these two companies, a young man named George II, Duke of Saxe-Meiningen, decided that he wanted to be invested more in theater. He started to study it more and more and get more and more involved. In fact, after um, a few uh, ill-fated marriages, uh, married an actress. I'm not an actress, I'm an actress. <laughs> he developed his own way of looking at a theatrical production and developed a style that unified the conception, the interpretation, and the practical execution of putting on a play. Now, he emphasized several things in his productions. The three I want to talk about today are one, historical accuracy and authenticity in the costumes and the sets that he put together. He was he wanted everything to feel unified, like it was part of the same world. Uh, and if you research him long enough, you'll find that he even made some of the costumes himself for his productions. Number two, he advocated for long and carefully planned rehearsal processes. Now, I think that this is particularly important considering that um, during Shakespeare's time, many of the actors that he had were not just actors. If you look at Midsummer Night's Dream, you had Bottom the Weaver and Snout the Tinker, so it's indicating that many actors also had other jobs. But with um, this kind of new uh, approach, these actors would be in rehearsals for uh, longer amounts of time, um, as opposed to the truncated rehearsals that were done during the Elizabethan times in Shakespeare's day. And finally, the most important thing that I want to get to is that 
all of the theatrical elements were unified into a singular artistic vision. And it's this artistic vision where we jump off on our discussion today of Hamlet's ghost. Because no matter what production you look at, every ghost of Hamlet's father is going to look different. They're all the same text. It's all the same kind of story that you're telling, but they're all going to look different because each director in the modern world is going to have their own particular artistic vision. Another word for that is concept. Before one nail is hammered, before one paintbrush is dipped, theater artists go through weeks, months, and in the case of million dollar huge productions, even years in a process known as pre-production. So at the beginning of this process, the director gets together with uh, the costume designer, lighting designer, set designer, um, sound designer, other production personnel, and they sit down and they talk about the production and it's during these early meetings that a director reveals their concept statement. So. What is a concept? A concept is basically the visual metaphor for a production. After reading the play several times and finding inspiration, making notes, a director is ready to come to his designers and to his whole production team with an idea for the show. Some people might call this the idea for the show, the premise. There's a lot of different ways that you can talk about a concept. I got an idea. So basically you're taking all of the notes that you've taken, all of the visual inspiration that you've, that you've researched through uh, paintings and photographs, and you're putting it into one visual metaphor known as a concept. So when presenting a concept, a director might put together something like a PowerPoint presentation. This allows them to show their inspiration, to talk about quotes or things in the play that really excite them, and to give some visual reference for designers to go back to when they're creating their set and costumes. This is, this is my presentation for the complete works of William Shakespeare Abridged that was to be performed <laughs> this summer. Unfortunately, this has had to be postponed because of the current situation. But we'll go through it quickly so you can see what a director might bring to a production meeting. First of all, you want to tell them what the concept is. And this is where I started. The complete works of William Shakespeare Abridged is a tragedian's playground. Well, now let's see what that means. Uh, if you look at that second paragraph, the charm of this piece is that our clowns don't necessarily know they're clowns. Just as Theseus proclaims in Midsummer, never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Our clowns are committed to a grand task because of their love for Shakespeare. So I'm taking um, inspiration from Shakespeare's work because it's about all of Shakespeare's work and putting it into this PowerPoint presentation. Uh, if you go down just a little bit further, we get to see what I mean about a playground. A playground, and there's some visual, uh, there's a visual representation of what I mean. And then here's some inspiration images. What is a tr an actor's playground? Um, you've got a trunk with a bunch of props, costumes, and things like that. Uh, here's some paintings, some uh, some historical research of, of what it was like to put together Shakespeare's stuff on a, on a shoestring budget back in the day. Uh, and inspiration for the piece. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art hot and sticky. Um, this idea of taking the old and smashing it, juxtaposing it with the, with the contemporary humor is exactly what the play does. And so that's where I was drawing my inspiration. So you're going to see that there's elements here that um, a director wants to emphasize in his play. One was audience contact. Another was music. Uh, this idea of worlds colliding was very important to me. Um, so I put in some inspiration pictures here for my costume designer. This idea, you have Salt Bay down there in the corner at the Last Supper. This idea of slamming contemporary with something that feels uh, very Elizabethan was is the main thing in the text. and It's one thing I wanted to emphasize in the play. And now to talk about a production where a concept was given and then it was actually realized. So you can see how there's a through line from idea, from concept, into production. So we'll take a look at one of Sheik on the Lake's uh, most recent productions, Richard III. And then I give my concept. Richard III is Anarchy in the UK 2.0. 
Anarchy in the UK was, of course, a famous Sex Pistols song that was about rejecting um, the status quo, and that's what Richard III was all about. And the kind of thing that we decided to uh, settle in on with this 2.0, Anarchy in the two, uh, UK 2.0, was futuristic minimalism. So I give a little bit more notes about our setting, some more inspiration pictures, and how Richard III is similar to uh, punk and punk music. Uh, here's one of his soliloquies mirrored with uh, one of some lyrics from a Sex Pistols song. Here's some of the look, just some ideas, lots of spikes, lots of leather. Now you may ask, why am I getting into all of this? Well, it's because I don't believe that history, and especially the trajectory of our, of our art form, happens in a vacuum. I, I think that it's more useful to look at this in a holistic sense, that there would be no ghoulish, scary lights and sound on a ghost of Hamlet coming and flying across the stage in the year 2020 if there wasn't a Miningham deciding that it all needed to have a unified concept to give it life, to give it purpose, and to serve the intention and the artistic integrity of the play. I think to address the question of how do you represent all of these different places on one single stage, one way to do that is through your set design. And one particular part of set design, the unit set. Now, unit set is a single set, which will stay the same throughout the play. This might represent many locations, it might represent one. You might change from one setting to the next by bringing in wagons or props. You might have one kind of stage that looks one way for a battlefield. You bring on a bed and a dresser and it becomes Gertrude's bedroom all of a sudden. And so, that's one way that you can deal with all of these different settings. So how do we use effects to make the ghost of Hamlet's father really spooky? <laughs> I think this is a question that needs to be answered on a timeline from the Renaissance until now. During Shakespeare's time, you were still working with universal lighting. So the main way that Shakespeare was able to set up a scene was through his language. That's why the text is always so potent, and that's why you hear me talk about it so much. In Shakespeare's day, his audience was, of course, known as an audience, indicating that the, um, that the sense of uh, hearing was uh, very important during his time. Remember, during Shakespeare's day, a common phrase was to hear a play. Remember what Hamlet says uh, in Act 2, Scene 1. He says, follow him, friends. We'll hear a play tomorrow. I think that the idea of hearing a play means that the text is really doing a lion's share of the stagecraft. Remember, LED lights and <laughs> naturalistic acting were still centuries away when Shakespeare was writing. And so he had to elegantly put it into his language to help us fill in the blanks. I love this quote from um, a book called Outlines of Shakespeare's Plays. Um, Whenever place or time mattered in a Shakespeare play, some references to them could be introduced into the dialogue, and if special atmospheric or dramatic effects were needed, they could be created by the poet's pen. Hence, it is to the Elizabethan stage that we are indebted in great measure for the exquisite descriptive poetry of Shakespeare. I think that's really cool. That the practical needs of the theater gave birth to all of this poetry. This all brings us to the ghost of Hamlet's father. Remember Henry V. Shakespeare knew that he had an uphill battle in presenting so many people in so many locations in the history of Henry V. He invokes the imagination of the audience. 
Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. He goes on to say, Think, when we talk of horses, that you see them, printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth. For tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings. For tis your thoughts that now must create our ghosts. <laughs> To be fair, this idea has also received some pushback, this idea of uh, hearing a play. Farah Kareem Cooper and Tiffany Stern are the editors of a 2013 collection of essays, Shakespeare's Theater and the Effects of Performance, written by themselves and nine other theater historians. One of my favorite things about their work is that they embrace what a theatrical magician Shakespeare really was. We talked about total theater last time and that Shakespeare was no stranger to that. Yes, Shakespeare was a wordsmith, and yes, he did write some of the most dazzling poetry ever in the history of the world, but you know what? He was also a shareholder in a theater, and he needed butts in the seats. Huh. I need money. Yes, he did ask the audience to participate in this world. So that means that there was no lack of visual stimulation to accompany these dazzling and profound words. Stern, Kareem Cooper, and company push back. They say that Shakespeare and his team were pushing the envelope when it came to special effects. There's a wonderful podcast put out by the Folger Theater, and I want you to take a listen to what they had to say about, specifically, the ghost of Hamlet's father. Oh, so in Hamlet, when the ghost is underneath the stage and he says, he says, swear, it has all of that extra meaning. Oh, yes, Absolutely. the audience know he's in hell. That's a thing. And, and Hamlet goes, oh, I don't know whether this is really a ghost or, or, or is it a goblin damned, you know, but the audience know. Mm. Um, so this is really going to... So entrances and exits and positions on stage will really have extraordinary interpretive relevance to the audience. You give a lot of examples of this. <laughs> the Witch's Cauldron yeah. in Macbeth, yes. which, which yes. sinks into the trap in the stage yeah. directions. Yeah, if, if you go down that trap, it's always bad. Because it goes down to hell, and <laughs> or otherwise you're so using it as Macbeth's the grave. So that's Macbeth's future. Yeah. So that means that that trap also has sort of accumulated resonance, and when any play uses it, it has the burden of all the other plays that have also used it and has affirmed and reaffirmed its meaning. And I think that's one thing that's just interesting about that theatre. There it is, sort of fixed but affecting meaning and accumulating meaning with repeated performance. Mm. Mm. Like onion skins. I mean, the point of the book is to really make people aware of that, but also how those effects work in concert with the writing itself. Mm. So it's not just about the language, but the language is obviously quite crucial to the entire process. So how do we create some of these Elizabethan special effects? Well, let's take a look. When you're looking to create some thunder, you have a few options. But probably the coolest sounding option is something called a thunder run. Basically, you're taking cannonballs and you're nudging them down a wooden slide that circles and coils its way through the rafters of a theater to create that kind of rumbling sound. It's a live sound. And so rather than just hearing it with your ears, you feel it with your body. One way that lightning was made was taking a powder made of resin and tossing it into a candle flame or a torch and it would just... It would light up like lightning. There was a strange piece of machinery called a swivel and basically um, they would fix a wire from the top of the theater on down to the floor and they would put a little firecracker on it and at the appointed time they would light it up and... It would shoot down the wire, sparks flying everywhere, and, and impressing all that were there to see it. With thunder, there's also something called a thunder sheet. And basically, you just pound this sheet, and it makes this low, rumbly sound. To the point of the authors I was talking about earlier, was this dangerous? Yes. Um, during a performance of Henry VIII, uh, an unfortunate incident, uh, there was a moment where there was supposed to be a battle in cannonballs, so... They'd got cannons and they lit them and <laughs> they exploded and a little bit of a spark came out. Now, the globe was made with um, wood, had a thatched roof, so most people today um, would decide maybe open flame is not what we want to do here. But hey, this was on the south bank of London during the Renaissance. 
<laughs> there were no rules. They got to have fun. So they lit those cannons up, a little spark got on that thatched roof, and boom, there went the globe. We don't want to leave out the sense of smell. Now, part of the way you make this smoke rise from the trap door was sulfur. Sulfur wasn't is not the best smelling substance in the world. It smells a little bit like rotting eggs. And it smells even worse when it's been lit up. So, as the witches and Macbee are emerging from that trap door and you've got this sulfur coming out and they say, hover through the fog and filthy air. That was filthy air, definitely. <laughs> so Shakespeare was engaging all of those senses at once. On a modern stage, of course, you have tons of options. And one of the ways that you do that is through creating a compelling sound design. I'll show you a little bit here. So, I'll show you a little program called QLab. So what you're seeing right now is a sound design that was done for Lear's Nightmare, which Shake on the Lake put on this past October, October of 2019. Now what you'll see are, I always number things A, B, C, D, E, F, G, rather than numbers, because most of the time, uh, lighting cues come in numbers. You put your track on there, and as you can see, you press go. Ah, let there be music. Now then, if I wanted to hop out of that, I press the escape button. And if you want to make a little adjustment here, you have all of these tools. Now, say I want to fade out, I'll just take this, plop it right there, and... Sounding good. Ooh, want to fade that out, so I go there. Ha-ha. And so you can use iTunes, you can use all kinds of things to create this, but this allows you to work with the volume of a piece. You can see that I've got it dipping, going up and down here. Um, you can turn it up and down, you can put different triggers on it, put different audio effects on it. Um, there's all kinds of things, pitch, a distortion. Um, so going into a, a, a Going into a program like QLab allows you a lot of freedom, and you can have a lot of fun, too. Of course, one of the best ways to convey a sense of otherworldliness with a character on stage is through the use of costume and makeup. So, I've included a link below in the description where you can see a little bit of how a set is constructed, and you can get a little bit of a ghoulish makeup makeover <laughs> tutorial. As far as the look of these ghosts, it's up to your imagination. I've seen the ghost of Hamlet in a completely pale face, gray hair, big sagging eyes. I've also seen it just appear as a voice and light. So the idea that it has to be realistic or convincing, uh, I think there's some elasticity <laughs> to the options that you have. Shakespeare was writing in a time before the advent of what we would call realism. He was firmly rooted in the theatrical. And doing his plays gives us a chance to live in that super truth. So, let your imaginary forces work. And I'll see you next time. Franz von Dingelschlecht. That's not his name. <laughs> and the birth <coughs> and the birth of a, and the birth of a little and number two. Oh my god, what am I talking about? I want to take a quick detour south to the rolling plains. Planes don't roll. He had a fair he had a flair that he had a flair for the theatrical.